the Leviathan Chronicles. An audio adventure. The story thus far. Ikoro has been killed. Senshin was forced to execute his lover before she could reveal the secret location of Sutton Manor to Jason Sterling of the Black Door Group. Sterling desperately wanted the location in order to obtain the schematics to a mysterious device that Evangeline is secretly building within Leviathan. Senshin believes this device is a powerful weapon that could exterminate mankind, leaving the Earth vacant to be occupied by Evangeline and her immortal brethren. In his last words to her, Jason Sterling told Ikoro that one of his agents, Whit Roberts, is now tracking Oberlin St. Clair in hopes of leading Black Door to McAllen Orsall. McAllen has been revealed to be a genetic clone of Evangeline, a product of the Rebellion's research to find a way to continue to commune with Starstones in order to perpetuate their immortality. Now, Senshin and Nathaniel are racing to Tibet to intercept Witch Roberts and learn what has happened to McAllen, and hopefully find some way to stop Evangeline from using the weapon she created. Meanwhile, deep under the ocean, near the Mariana Trench, McAllen, Harlequin, Anton and Tully were still traveling in a stolen submarine to rendezvous with the rogue Starstone that is sending out a deadly signal, killing the immortals on the surface. However, they are unaware that they are being pursued. And somewhere, 500 miles west of Beijing, Oberlin St. Clair and his mysterious companion, Mai Li, are about to be served dessert in the dining car of the Tangula Railway Express, the world's most luxurious train, as it heads towards Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. And now, Chapter 19, The Briefcase, Part 2. Madame, may I take your plates? Certainly. Please give my compliments to the chef. The catfish was the best I ever had. We'll see the dessert menu. Dessert? But you didn't even touch a bit of your venison. I wasn't hungry. No, but I can see that you're thirsty. You blew through the first two bottles of Bordeaux, and you're not keen on giving me much of the third. If you're that thirsty, we'll order a fourth. I think you're forgetting. I had my pinky shot off a few days ago. I'm not even supposed to be drinking while I'm on these painkillers. If I... Our dessert menu, as you requested. May I personally recommend the dark chocolate hazelnut souffle? It is our chef's specialty, but I must warn you the preparation time is over. Cognac, the Remy Extra, two glasses. Of course, madame. Right away. Oh, but but I think I will have one of them chocolate souffles you mentioned. Ah, damn. Not sure if he heard me. Souffles fall. They always fall. What's that supposed to mean? <sighs> Nothing. Look, I think I know when someone's trying to lose themselves in drink. I'm Irish, you know. But I don't want to watch you getting sauced before I can get some answers. And what answers do you want, Oberlin St. Clair? Let's start with you. Who are you, really? How did you know how to find me when the Idrisil went down? I told you, my name is Miley. And who do you work for, Miley? Miley swirled the remains of the 1986 Chateau Margot in her wine glass and looked out the train window. It was now night, and all she could see was her own reflection in the darkened glass. She wanted to see beyond her image, to the arid desert that lay stretched out hundreds of miles on each side of the train. But the window was still a mirror, albeit a cold one, and it felt good to rest her warm forehead against it. I work for the Black Door Group. What? The same guys that held me captive and tried to kill me? Wait, the ones that tried to kill you? What, what do you mean you're part of the Black Door Group? Keep your voice down. I'm sorry, but I think you owe me some answers. I saved your life twice recently. I think you need to reevaluate who owes whom. <sighs> I don't understand any of this. I just need you to tell me what the hell is going on. Fine, but not here. Miley asked for the check and took the two glasses of cognac back to the lush cabin that the two of them shared together. Okay, now talk to me. How can you be part of the Black Door group? You guys were shooting at each other at the sanctuary place in Beijing. So what exactly is going on? Miley opened the closet door of the cabin and slipped out of her Alexander McQueen dress. She walked to the bathroom in her high heels and thong to grab one of the plush cotton robes. This was the second time Oberlin had seen Miley naked during the course of the evening. But as impressive as the sight was, he recognized a distraction play when he saw one. Explain it to me again, Miley. Who exactly are you? I told you. I am part of the Black Door Group. 
I am door number three. And what about Whit Roberts? He is also Black Door. He is part of door number twelve. How many doors are there? Twenty. And how many are totally fucking psychotic? Less than you would think. So why was Black Door... I mean door number twelve trying to kill door number three? Because of you, you idiot. Because I got a hold of you before they could get you back. And more importantly, because of that. Miley pointed to the briefcase that lay on the table between the bed and mahogany dresser. I wanted that. What? The briefcase? Oh, let me guess. You want to speak to gods now, too? No. I want to speak to my father. My Lee, who exactly is your father? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know who your father is? I don't know what my father is. Traitor? Hero? Scientist? Victim? Spy? My Lee stood up wearily and retrieved a bottle of Corvazier VSOP from the minibar. <sighs> It's not EXO, but it will do under the circumstances. She poured herself a generous glass and gestured the bottle towards Oberlin. No, no, thank you. What exactly do you mean you don't know what your father is? Can't you just give me a straight answer? You must know something about I him. I know that he abandoned my mother and I when I was only nine to work on a remote astronomy field assignment for two years. He left my mother a note. What did your mother do? She left him. She took me to America where we started our lives over again. I was never allowed to speak of my father again. I tried for decades to reach him, to understand why my father made the choices he made, why he abandoned my mother and I. I wrote letters. I tried to contact him. And your father never wrote you back? Not until six years ago. Miley, what was your father's name? Dr. Tang Sui. Six years ago, deep in the Mariana Trench, Dr. Tensui bolted into the main corridor of the High Tenshi. Sprinting crewmen violently pushed past him as they ran to their emergency stations. The ship was sinking, and the secret mission he had been a part of for the past three weeks had gone horribly wrong. Attention all crew members. This is the captain. The High Tenshi is experiencing cascade level system failures. I order all personnel to initiate the Omega Protocol on my mark. T minus four minutes. The Omega Protocol? That means the captain will fire two torpedoes to turn back on the ship after their timers run out, the ship will be scuttled. The Starstone will be lost. Our key to extraterrestrial communication. It must not be lost. But who can I turn to? Who has the resources to find the Starstone at over 20,000 feet underwater? The doctor ran down the narrow hallway of the sub. He almost made it all the way before a crowd of seven men came rushing down in the opposite direction, smashing right into him and throwing him to the ground. <sighs> Get up! Get up! Didn't you hear the klaxon? The captain is going to scuttle the ship! We have to get to the escape pod! You fool! Those torpedo shells will never hold at this depth! Then stay here and die! I don't care! The man ran after his fellow crewmen heading towards the weapons room, leaving Dr. Sui to wearily pick himself up and continue running down the hall. My daughter, she must know. I have to make her know. Ugh. The submarine lurched over on its left side, sending the doctor sprawling on the ground again, this time with a small gash on the side of his head to show for it. Other crew members continued to push past him and yell at him to follow, but at this moment of calamity, it was every man for himself, and if one madman chose to stay with the sinking ship, no precious moment would be wasted considering him. The doctor continued to navigate through the waves of soldiers moving in the opposite direction, until he came to the communications center of the High Ten Shi. He slammed open the metal door to find the communication specialist gathering up all of the CDs on the primary console into a satchel. Quickly, I'm shut Shutting down the system and collecting all data concerning our mission. I'll help you. What should I do? Grab those discs on the far wall. But instead of the discs, Dr. Sui grabbed a fire extinguisher off the wall and crept up behind the frantic communications officer. You think- ah! With the unconscious officer on the floor, Dr. Sui ran over to lock the door and then sat in front of the primary communications console. His fingers flew furiously across the keyboard. My Lee, my dearest daughter, the angel of my conscience. I wish I had more time to speak to you, but I'm afraid the time I have left is very limited. You and your mother left China when you were very young. She was a talented university professor, and I, well, I was always consumed with my work. Looking up at the stars, instead of looking down on my knee to see the shining daughter I was so blessed to have, and growing so fast in front of me, so smart at such an early age, I had such dreams for you. <sighs> but your mother had dreams as well. She wanted more from life than I could give her in China. She defected to America without telling me, taking you with her. 
As my responsibilities in Section 9 grew, the Chinese Politburo kept me sequestered and unable to reach out to you. A traitor for defecting to America. Your mother was always a strong woman, probably stronger than I'll ever be. I hope you've inherited her strength from her. But as I said, my remaining time is limited, and the time has come for you to understand the true nature of my work. It is, sadly, all I can offer you as a father. I know that I have made questionable choices with my life, but I want you to know who I am and what I've achieved. Astronomy and my conviction that life exists beyond our world have fueled me at the cost of almost everything. I have betrayed my country, my wife, and sadly even you, my only child. I am guilty of being many things, but one thing I am not, and that is a fool. I have done it by Lee. I have found the connection between life on Earth and life in the stars. It exists, my Lee. But things have gone so horribly wrong. Perhaps I have trusted the wrong people. And I feel my only salvation, my discovery, might be lost. That is why I'm writing to you, my dear daughter. I regret not being the father I should have been. But I have been double the scientist that any man in China has ever been. Know that I was no coward. I was no traitor. And most importantly, I was right. The Starstone Link exists. My only gift that I can give you is the forbidden knowledge that I was entrusted to keep. I gift it to you now. To find the Starstone, look deeper than any man has ever looked. Deep within the darkest parts of the ocean. I regret that I don't know where exactly I am, but with me I carry the most valuable artifact ever discovered by man. It will be lost here under miles of ocean, unless you can find it. We ventured out from Qingdao a few weeks ago, and I suspect our craft is going down somewhere en route to the Mariana Trench. I have intelligence that tells me you have excelled in your studies, and are now rising quickly in your role in the United States Foreign Service. Perhaps you can use your influence to find this treasure, perhaps if you can find it. You will know that your father amounted to something more than your mother has told you. Perhaps you will unlock the secrets that I came so close to discovering. Life exists beyond this world, my Lee. There are those on this earth who know of it, and who have protected it for thousands of years. Immortals walk among us. Find them, find the Starstone, and then find the sum of my life. Perhaps then, you will know who your father was. I will always love you. Your father, Teng Sui. Dr. Sui encrypted the message and sent his last words to his only daughter. He pushed his chair away from the keyboard and just stared at the glowing screen in front of him. His heart felt heavy and his feet wouldn't move. Why did I never reach out to her? She never would have understood. She wanted a father. China needed a scientist. Feelings are irrelevant. She was so beautiful. Oh, how I loved you, my Lee. But if I didn't pursue the work, nobody would. They called me crazy. Perhaps I was a fool to think I could pull it all off. I failed miserably. Oh my god, I've, I've failed them all. I'm ready to be lost to the deep. I deserve to die. To be erased. I'm ready to no longer exist. Oh no. 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 My first job is survival. I must survive. For her, I will survive. The ship is breaking apart. I must escape. The doctor threw the chair aside and ran towards the door. T minus two minutes. He ran back into the hallway and was horrified by what he saw. Over ten men were lying on the floor of the hallway with blood seeping from their heads and ears. Steam was pouring out of one of the pressure pipes along the ceiling. The explosion must have shattered them. But the doctor ignored the men in pain. He ignored their pleas of help. Instead, he ran down the hallway to get the ladder that led down to the lower level where the weapons room was situated. Many of the men lying on the floor pulled at his legs. Some barely moved at all. I can't hear anything. The doctor kept his head level and refused to look down at the doomed men. They can't be saved. Maybe I can't either. He grabbed the ladder and slid down quickly, not allowing his feet to touch the rungs. The lower level felt markedly warmer than the previous one. The doctor could hear the voices of men actively shouting at the far end of the hallway, but he couldn't see them through the steam that was now erupting through the multiple breaches in the overhead pipework. Wrapping his arms around his head, he sprinted down as fast as he could, trying to get... 
A door hatch exploded outwards just inches behind the doctor. Fire erupted out of the doorway, burning the hair on the back of the doctor's head. The force of the explosion lifted him off his feet and slammed him into the wall. Uh. And when the doctor tried to get up, the floor seemed to move away from him. As his senses returned, he realized that the floor was moving away from him. The high tenshi was now listing off to its side, and the left wall was now becoming the floor. T minus 90 seconds. I have to keep moving. The torpedoes, they will destroy the ship. The doctor did his best to keep running quickly, but the strangeness of the hallway now turned on its side, made for slow going. The doctor tripped on the doorways that were now the floor. He tripped again, and this time it was over one of the many corpses that littered the hallway. The weapons room was now just a few feet ahead. He reached for the door. The metal on the door was scalding and Dr. Swee ripped the shirt off one of the fallen crewmen to use as protection for his hands. The doctor rammed into the scalding door and fell into the weapons room, which was now covered in flames on its left and right sides. The doctor looked around the room and in the far corner found several massive tubes that were part of the superstructure of the High Ten Shi. Oh, this is it. But I need to find an evacuation vessel, an escape pod. They're supposed to be stored next to the torpedo tubes. The room is so disorienting. The doctor looked around everywhere for one of the evacuation vessels, but only one last module still remained on the backmost rack. Dr. Swee raced to a charred keyboard and rapidly entered the command for a robotic arm to place the evacuation vessel into the torpedo tube. The vessel was hollow to allow just enough space for a single man inside, with a small series of controls and switches embedded within. The vessel was now loaded and ready for deployment. But suddenly, a junior member of the engineering corp burst into the flaming room. The young man quickly scanned the room, searching for an evacuation tube, but seeing only one left. He and Dr. Swee locked eyes. The two men flung themselves at each other, grabbing one another's throat. The young boy had strong hands and his thumbs pushed hard on Dr. Swee's larynx. He was four inches taller than the doctor, and the older man could not gain the needed leverage over his faster opponent. But age has its virtues. Dr. Swee brought up his knee hard, sending waves of agony through the boy's pelvis. The young crewman buckled over, allowing the doctor to wind back and deliver a hard fist across the boy's jaw. But Dr. Swee was 51 years old, and his punch lacked the impact that it had at 25. The boy's head spun, but he quickly recovered to straighten himself up and deliver a clear shot to the doctor's solar plexus. All of the air in the doctor's body left him. A greasy Phillips head screwdriver lay on the cluttered countertop. With the last of his receding strength, the doctor grabbed the screwdriver and spun around blindly, swinging his arm upwards. The tip of the screwdriver found the young boy's right cornea, and the doctor drove it upwards until the plastic handle was touching the boy's nose. The boy reeled backwards, and the doctor could see his remaining eye open wide with terror. But before the shock could register, the doctor delivered a roundhouse kick, not strong enough to knock the boy down, but strong enough to push him into the wall of flames that had taken over the rear of the weapons room. I am sorry. The doctor raced over to the torpedo tubes, where the robotic arm had now loaded the last evacuation vessel into the launch chamber. He bent down on one knee and was about to shimmy into the thick titanium tube head first when he paused for an instant to look over his right shoulder. The boy was engulfed in fire and was now on his knees. The boy's head pointed directly at the doctor, but no face was visible any longer through the flames. This mass of fire was no longer a man, but a shrieking, moving entity that would be forever burned into the mind of Dr. Swift. It would be the last image he ever had of the High Ten Shi. The doctor quickly squeezed himself into the tube by moving his shoulders back and forth. He kept his arms tucked underneath his chest and used his elbows for leverage. T minus 20 seconds. The activation button. Where is the turn activation button? The doctor's fingers finally felt a large, grooved button that was vibrating intensely. He punched the button and felt the entrance lid of the evacuation vessel slam shut about 20 inches below his feet. The tiny cavity pressurized, and Dr. Sui felt momentum bolsters extend to brace his legs, hips, and shoulders for the force of the launch. Movement, except the tiniest area around his hands and face, was now impossible. Dr. Sui could see three indication lights with a large button over the third. Systems are positive. Launch is active. Go, go, go! 
The evacuation vessel exploded out of the torpedo tube. Dr. Sui felt his body slam against the cold titanium of the chamber. All of the interior bracing clamps kept his body locked in a rigid position. But the doctor still struggled to keep his neck straight against the velocity of the launch. His speed suddenly slowed tremendously, and he realized that he was now in open water. Depth! Depth! What is the depth? The torpedoes! The heightened she! No! 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 The evacuation module that was programmed to rise to the surface was being thrown deeper into the Mariana Trench. The doctor's eyes widened in terror when he saw the reading of the depth gauge inches in front of his face. 26,000 feet and sinking. The module won't hold at its depth. Controls. There have to be some. Ah! The trench. I'm being pushed into the trench. The force of the high Tenshi's explosion sent the evacuation module careening into the deep walls of the trench that were pocketed with sharp outcroppings and caverns. The module scraped against its side until its speed slowed down enough to be stopped completely between two large underwater boulders. My god. My god. <laughs> The doctor tried to move, but he couldn't. The bracing clamps were still locked into place and had clearly been damaged in the impact. Most of the digital displays directly in front of the doctor's face were damaged or just non-functional. In fact, the only illumination within the cramped vessel came from a single green LED light, one inch from the doctor's face, that was blinking irregularly. Can't move. I can't. Not only was the doctor acutely aware of the fact that he couldn't move any part of his body, but now he felt the temperature dropping. The beginnings of shivers were creeping through his legs. But how much power can remain in this damaged vessel? A few hours? A few days? The chamber could flood at any second. I could die at any second. And so the doctor waited. For hours. For days. The shivering had now taken over his entire body and came in fits and starts as his body began to succumb to hypothermia. His throat ached with thirst as the condensation from his breath coalesced around him and icy drops pricked him out of his delirium. He desperately wanted the infuriating blinking green light in front of his eyes to stop. He was trapped in an underwater prison without the ability to move his body a single inch to generate warmth. And now the walls were literally closing in on him. So many ways to die. Thirst, hunger, cold, asphyxiation. Please, take me, Lord. Just let the vessel rupture and just release me. I pray for death. The doctor faded in and out of consciousness for the next 10 hours as his air supply dwindled and the frigid cold left him feeling completely disconnected from the rest of his body that he could now no longer see anyway. He waited for death to come at any given instant. Until... Uh, the doctor felt the evacuation module shudder and suddenly move backwards slightly. The module must be slipping off the cliff. I will fall. Into the abyss. But the doctor noticed something strange. The constant sounds of metal fatigue from the evacuation module being crushed by the colossal pressure of the ocean depth had stopped. In fact, the only sound the doctor could hear was a faint rumbling that sounded vaguely mechanical in nature. What? What is happening? No vessel can operate at such depth. No vessel I... The doctor fell unconscious. Indeed, he drifted in and out of consciousness for the next several hours, fantasizing that the rumbling sound that surrounded him was his father's old Packard station wagon that had come to take his soul to rest. But suddenly, the rumbling sound that enveloped him before was replaced by something new. The sound of a door, a vast great door, resonated all around him. He felt forward motion again, and soon before he realized it, he felt the evacuation module being manipulated to stand upright. <sighs> Moments passed as the doctor's mind raced in confusion, before a blinding light burst open in front of him as the outer section of the module was peeled backward. A three-foot-wide gap was now opened in front of the doctor, <sighs> and his whole body collapsed through it, landing on the floor of a large, softly lit room. His eyes were swollen, but he strained to take in his surroundings. A crowd of countless people stood towards the back of the room, dressed in various coloured jumpsuits and robes. They seemed to be keeping their distance from the doctor. But then, 
Two distinct people emerged from the crowd. The first was a tall man in a long white robe and hood that obscured his face. Though it seemed eons ago, Dr. Sui recognized the man as Benu, the immortal that had approached him to steal the Starstone from the Chinese government. Behind him walked a slender woman with long crimson hair. The crowd seemed to give the woman a great deal of deference as she strode past Benu to approach Dr. Sui, who was still sprawled weakly on the floor. She bent over him gently and extended her hand to his. He took it and felt the warmth in her hand radiate through his chilled body. He could only stare blankly at the beautiful woman. She smiled kindly at him and then looked over to Benu. Is he the one? Benu nodded slightly. Hello, Dr. Sui. My name is Evangeline. Welcome to Leviathan. Your father was Dr. Tang Sui, head of Section 9, the man that discovered the Star Stone. Yes, Oberlin. He is also the man that betrayed his country, murdered in the name of science, and left his daughter without a father. So, so what happened? You heard the message. As Hai Ten Shi's mission went haywire, my father used his last dying minutes to send that message to me, the daughter he abandoned for 30 years. Your father sounded like he was an incredibly brave man. I can't imagine what it must have been like trapped underwater in a sinking submarine, but his last thoughts were of you, his daughter. He wanted to make amends. It feels a bit late. More like an old man that just wants to get into heaven. She took a long drink of cognac. I know it's none of my business, but I think you're being unfair to the man, and unfair to yourself. He may not have been the father you wanted, but at least he realized he had made some mistakes. Believe me, I knew some men back in Ireland that didn't even know the names of their children. He didn't have to stay in China. He could have- Miley's glass of cognac fell to the floor. Fucking bastard. He only wanted to talk to gods, but not his own child. Look, Miley, I'm not sure what the polite way to say this is, but I think you're being a bitch, and I think you've had too much to drink tonight. It's just, just no way to react to your father's last words. What did you say? I said it's no way to react to your father's last words. They weren't his last words. What? What? What do you mean? You said he sent this message to you before the High Ten Shi exploded six years ago. Miley reached into the satchel beside her and tossed over in a folder. I received this message from my father one week ago. Are you shitting me? One week ago, you thought your father had died six years ago, and then... I... well... Well, what did the message say? Read it. Oberlin stared at Mai Li for a moment, then opened the folder and read the message inside. Mai Li, there, there isn't, isn't much, much time, time, so I, I must be brief. brief. I, have I have found, found a way for us to be reunited. To undo the damage I have caused, you must proceed to the following coordinates in exactly ten days' time. Communication can be established at 45, 63 petahertz. If you need proof, you can listen to the briefcase I designed. Remember, a cat may look at a king. Your father, Tung Sui. What the fuck is this? An invitation, or a warning, I'm honestly not sure. What does this mean, a cat may look at a king? A quote from Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book as a child. It means that even the most humble of subjects can approach royalty, that nothing is beyond the grasp of the believer. <laughs> well, where are these coordinates located? High in the mountains of Tibet. Actually, it points to one mountain in particular, Mount Cheng Lung. So that's why we're going to Tibet. So you can be reunited with your dead father on some remote mountaintop. How about a meeting in a nice cafe in Dublin? Or a noodle shop in Hong Kong? Why do My father is in danger. What are you talking about? The signal frequency he gave me. It's an incredibly high frequency. It can't even be registered by standard equipment. When I tried to access it, I discovered something. What? Wit Roberts. The man who was trying to kill you, he's Black Door. But your Black Door! Not like him. His group tried to exterminate all the other doors. They wanted to destroy anybody that had power equal to theirs. They're evil, and they have a plan. What plan? I don't know, but it has to do with the briefcase you're carrying with you. I believe it's what my father was referring to. Somehow, he's mixed up with Jason Sterling's group, door number 12. When I accessed the signal he gave me, I began tracking the hydrocell as it entered Chinese airspace heading towards Tibet. When the escape pod was jettisoned, I thought I had my chance to capture Whit Roberts and discover what happened to my father. But instead you got me. I got more than you. What do you mean? 
I got the briefcase. And now Whit Roberts will have to come to us. What's this, us? I don't want to be around when that little psychopath gets back here. I'm going to the first airport in Tibet and getting as far away from all of you that I can. Then you'll never see your friend Tully again. What the hell are you talking about? You, me, my father, Tully, even Black Door, they're all connected. The answers to everything we're looking for lie in Tibet. I don't know where your friend Tully is, and I know you don't either, but Whit Roberts does, and he wants to be in Tibet, and he wants whatever it is in that briefcase. If you run away now, you'll be running away from any chance you have at answers. Maybe he'll try to chase you, maybe he won't. But I've got a strange feeling that in three days' time, none of it will matter anymore, and you'll lose the only window you have. Oberlin winced as he looked down at his injured hand that now held only four fingers on it. I suppose you're right. And besides, I think it's time. Miley stood and walked over to Oberlin Sinclair, knelt in front of him, and placed her lips just inches from his. Oh, uh, time for what? To see what's in the briefcase, silly. You're pretty good at picking locks. I'm good at a lot of things. What do you make of this? <laughs> I've never seen anything like this before in my life. The two of them opened the briefcase to find what looked like a complex control panel fully embedded within its cavity. In fact, there was no space in the briefcase to actually hold anything else. A series of six knobs bisected the center of the console, while two meshed sections resembling speakers dominated the upper right and left corners. At least 20 buttons and switches of various sizes surrounded two LED screens in the lower half of the device. Oberlin carefully scrutinized the surface of the console and put his finger over one of the larger buttons that was colored green. He stared at Mai Lee. She stared back and gave a slight shrug. Why not? It briefly occurred to Oberlin that pushing random buttons on an unknown device created by the deadliest group on Earth might not be the smartest idea he'd ever had. But then he thought of Tully, and he pushed the button. The console vibrated ever so slightly, and then suddenly erupted in a flash of colors and sound. A nine-inch telescopic stalk extended from between the two speakers in the upper half of the console. One of the LED screens was racing through various number sequences, while the other screen depicted fluctuating oscillation waves. This is a communications device. But designed to communicate with whom? I guess we'll have to find out. Look at the knobs and switches. All of the increments are in Chinese. Your father. My Lee stared back at Oberlin. Let's get this operational. Oberlin's fingers began to dance across the surface of the console, testing and examining each instrument. He paused after activating each switch to measure its effect relative to the knobs he was manipulating. Keep going until that other light. Hours passed, and strange sounds began to emanate from the console. As Oberlin tried to stabilize the frequency oscillation, a rapid succession of numbers flitted across the left screen and then suddenly stopped. Miley translated the meaning of the Chinese inscriptions as fast as she could but it did little to help Oberlin gain a handle as to how to clarify the broken audio signal he was now receiving. I think we're getting something. Finally, after turning the two far knobs together, he was able to isolate just a bit of the transmission that was coming through the speakers. Um, hello? Who is this? Can you hear me? This is Oberlin St. Clair. I'm... I'm an engineer. I, I, I want to help you. But I need to know who are you. What was that about Black Door? I, I can't hear you. Please say again. We are trapped. So much pain. Please help us. Of course. We want to help you, but first, you must tell us where you are. Who is holding you? Can you read me? Where exactly are you? We are being held in the Bible. The great Tangula locomotive had been slowing imperceptibly for the last 100 miles so that the momentum of stopping would not awake any of its well-heeled passengers while they slept. It pulled into a Spartan rail station in the remote Kunlun region, 80 miles south of Yushofeng. 
The station itself was little more than a wooden platform, with four small concrete utility sheds at the far end that displayed the Tangula logo. As the massive train pulled to a stop, several engineers raced from the rear of the train to secure fresh water hoses from the utility sheds and affix them to the bottom of the rearmost car. The platform itself stood empty, except for a single figure that stood motionless in the dark. One of the cabin stewards approached the man using a small flashlight. Good evening, Dr. Gordon. It is a pleasure to welcome you aboard the Tangula Railway. Let me have my men attend to your bags. I think you will find your accommodations to be satisfactory. Dare I say, far better than your research station in the Tibetan Outback. You are very fortunate that our train needed to stop for fresh water supplies in such a remote village. This section of the Tibetan Plateau is almost uninhabited. May I ask what it is you are studying, Dr. Gordon? Astronomy. You know, looking up at the stars. been listening to the Leviathan Chronicles. The Leviathan Chronicles was written and created by Christoph Lepupka, produced by Robin Shaw, produced and musical composition by Luke Allen, directed by Nobi Nakanishi. For a full list of cast and crew, or to purchase the ad-free director's cut, go to leviathanchronicles.com. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for listening. To discover more podcasts set in the Leviathan universe, go to leviathanaudioproductions.com or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Leviathan Audio Production.